So I want to say welcome along and welcome to all those who are watching um, over the internet. Uh, we, have nev we never have any idea of how many there are, but this thing goes to the world. So welcome wherever you are and welcome to, our, to you folks here this morning. Now when Pastor Eunice said to me last week, would you take the surface? I said, fine, what do you want me to talk about? He says, I want you to talk about freedom. I thought to myself, I didn't say it, I, that's a bit of a strange topic. But as I thought about during the week, I realised that the whole Bible is about freedom. And I want you to think through that concept with me this morning. My aim this morning is to encourage every one of you to believe Oh, but you say, we believe, we believe. Of course you believe, but I want you to really believe. Know that Jesus is willing to help in every one of your individual situations. He's interested in work, in getting you a job, in your sore toe. I want you to, that's what I'm going to encourage you to believe in. He's that detailed in his care for each one of us. I want to start with a verse. I've, I've called this uh, topic The Great Escape. And I want to start with a verse before we even get to that one uh, that is the theme of my talk this morning. It's John 10.10. 10. And it says, and you know it well, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that they might have life and life to the full. The first part of my talk, I'm going to deal with the first part of the per first part of that sentence. I have come that they might have life. That is freedom. And the second part, I want to concentrate on and have it to the full, because that qualifying phrase I think means something. So that's what I discovered. The whole Bible is about freedom and how to become free. Well, why is that? It's because this world is occupied. We live in an enemy-occupied world. The devil and a third of his angels are surrounding us all the time. Enemy forces. We are imprisoned in many ways. I want to refer to Revelation 12. It's a text. All these texts you know well. Then there was war in heaven. John says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels and the dragon lost the battle and he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one who deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Just imagine, just imagine how the devil felt at that point when he was thrown out, chucked out of heaven, down to this earth. He was a proud individual. How was he feeling? So, about 4000 BC, creation happened and it was a marvellous place to be, the Garden of Eden. Eve was confronted by a cunning, angry, hurt devil. God had said to them, you can eat. It. Eden in its perfect state was free. And that's how God wants it always to be. But a problem arose there and we all know about that. Peace, harmony, freedom. You may freely eat everything, but don't touch the one in the middle there. Well, the moment that Adam and Eve ate um, of that forbidden fruit in the centre of the garden, life suddenly changed. You could say all hell broke loose. And from then until now, man has been chained imprisoned in some way. I want you to think through this with me. So bad was the evil 
that God had to wipe out humanity and start again with Noah and his three kids and their wives. That's only 1,200 years down the track. For us, ancient history begins at that point, after the flood. 2800 BC, our written records go back to. And the history of man from that time is a history of war. Swords and shields and chariots and walled cities and battering rams of the ancient world have been replaced today by bombs and artillery and naval blockades. The army of the ancient world has been joined today by a navy and an air force. Death and destruction are happening somewhere in the world right now. The old serpent, the devil, has pretty well had his way. We live in an enemy-occupied world, and that's why the language of Scripture is couched in the language of freedom. So let's ground this talk in some Scripture. There's heaps I've realised on freedom in Scripture, and I've just chosen eight or nine verses. It's for freedom... Galatians says that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't be encumbered anymore by a yoke of slavery. And the next one, we'll just run straight through these. Here's a great text. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. And that's, where, that's our position right now. We are free and free indeed. And the next one. For when you are deadened to sin... You are freed from all its power and allure over you. Think about it. The ancient, well, it's not ancient, but in the New Testament, the rite of baptism is couched in the terms of freedom. We died to sin and we rise to a new life. And that verse there, we are deadened to sin. John 8, 32, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I hope you're thinking as we go through how that affects me. What has the effect of receiving Jesus made on my life? It's absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life, says Paul. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do. That'll destroy your freedom. And the next one. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. When Jesus was asked to read from the scriptures in the synagogue, he chose this text, the Isaiah scroll, and read, he sent me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, announce freedom to all captives, pardon all prisoners. That means that whether we realise it or not, we are prisoners. The creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. I shouldn't perhaps have have, um, included that one because that is looking forward to the end. It's a glorious freedom that we'll enjoy when we get to heaven. But right now, we can be free and free indeed. Consider some of these freedom images in the rest of Scripture. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who trust in the Lord, I want you to note that, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. To me, that picture of the eagle, that's a picture of freedom. Freedom. And that's what we are promised if we trust. <clears throat> Daniel 
David, in the Psalms, calls God a hiding place. When you hide, other than playing hide and seek, what does that mean? When you've found a hiding place, how do you feel? Secure. That's right. You are hiding from something that's threatening you so that in fact God being our hiding place means that we are free of fear or the enemy or something. He is our shield, it says. What's that shield do? Well, I've never had practice at this one. This was ancient. This was ancient warfare. But that shield prevented arrows or spears or daggers or whatever from getting through to my body. Can you see how calling God our shield and buckler is, a, is, a, is freedom from, again, freedom from danger, from threats? He talks in another place, he is our rock. Think about that for a minute. What does that mean? We have, what does a rock um, promise? Freedom from? Any ideas will be good. When it says that God is our rock, he is unmovable. He is reliable. He's always there. You can always run. That's true, isn't it? It's a very good image of the freedom that we have in Jesus. great story of freedom in the Old Testament, of course, is the, es the escape from Egypt. Link that picture of Moses at the Red Sea with the picture 2,000 years later of Jesus on the cross, where Jesus is virtually saying, let my people go. It's the same thing, isn't it? Same message. <clears throat> the very articles of the, the, of the sanctuary. Think about a few of those. The candlestick pointed forward to Jesus, the light of the world. That's freedom from darkness, superstition, ignorance. Table of showbread pointed forward to Jesus, the bread of life. That's spiritual hunger, freedom from hunger. The manna in the Ark of the Covenant pointed to freedom from all want. It reminded the children of Israel that God provided them with everything they needed that they couldn't provide for themselves. Of course, the whole point of the sanctuary, the morning and evening sacrifice, the killing of those lambs morning and evening, represented Jesus, of course, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's freedom from the power and the effects of sin. <clears throat> God's great plan of salvation was sublimely simple in concept, yet staggering in what it accomplished. Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And whosoever... What a small word that is, but with marvellous implication. Whosoever, from Adam till now, may come. I want you to ponder for a moment what your salvation has meant to you. Where would you be today if Jesus had not found you? I've entitled this talk, The Great Escape. I borrowed the title from the movie of the same name. On March the 24th, 1944, one of the most audacious projects in World War II occurred. It was the mass escape of 76 Allied soldiers from the German prisoner of war camp, Stalag Luft III, the story of which was forever immortalised in that 1963 film, The Great Escape. Can I see the hands of those who have seen that movie? Steve McQueen. I want to play you a clip now.
Beautiful. When I, when I saw that in the theatre, the whole theatre stood up and clapped and shouted. <laughs> that clip captures the euphoria of escape to freedom that you and I experience when we decide to accept God's great gift of salvation. It is the great escape for you and me. Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, I've come that they may have life and life to the full. That's the troubling bit. I've, I've pondered for years why that quali- qualifying phrase was tagged on to that. I think that it has significant meaning. I can only share that thought with you this morning. That troubling text. And have it to the full. What does that mean? Because I happen to think that many true believers, like you and me, are travelling possibly third class to heaven. When a first class passage is on offer. Saved? Yes. But still dying with heart attack from the worries of this life. Think this through with me. When we have extra bread, we will often throw some loaves onto the lawn for the birds. It doesn't take very Who does that? Throws a bit of bread out. It doesn't take very long for the sparrows to discover it, does it? But do they flock down onto the bread all at once? Have the sparrows around my place, they sit on the roof up there and they look around and they say, what's going on here? Is this a trap? And they come down onto the fence. They're still looking around, unsure to go, of whether they should go down there. Then they hit the ground and then some minutes later, they're into it. And then when I open the door to, flow, to, to, to throw a little bit more bread out, suddenly a mass of fluttering wings and they're gone. They trust no one or nothing. And I see this scenario as a mini picture of humanity, including you and me, who are secure sometimes in the knowledge of salvation. We're desperate to get a job, fearful of losing it, constantly aware of what others think, what we do, how we live, what school our kids attend. It's called keeping up with the Joneses. What we wear, who we hang out with, fashion industry is built on that. We are suspicious, we lock our doors, build high fences, install surveillance cameras. Security industry is built on those fears. We insure our cars, houses and lives. Insurance industry is built on our fear of loss. When you think about it today, is there anything concerning you in the world? Does, I thought through that this week and I wondered whether it could be, if, you've, if you read the news, nuclear war. The world is unhappy with China's growth, I can tell you. Perhaps it's cancer or diabetes. Or perhaps global warming. Perhaps COVID. Three weeks ago, last Thursday, we were with Jessica and Ben and the five girls. On Friday, Jacinda announced that the borders were closing today and we had a week of grace to get back. Now, we have to come back to New Zealand. But getting back to New Zealand was like flying a sortie over enemy territory, I can tell you in wartime. So we hastily decided that we would have to leave. We were two days journey from our home and from the plane trip that we had booked out of Melbourne. We were in a red zone, according to Victoria. New South Wales was red zoned. That's it, blanket. But we had to get back there. I think Jessica provided a key. She found us a transit permit to go through Victoria because Victoria, where we live, had locked its borders to the rest of the world. We left on Monday morning 
I wasn't game to pray, Lord, send a miracle. I prayed simply for God's favour because I wasn't sure whether we were doing the right thing. We'd read and read and read and I didn't know whether we were doing the right thing and getting on the road and leaving. That was confirmed when we got on the highway. There were no cars out there, only trucks. And we were a lone car flashing down that highway. And the signs, <clears throat> big signs, lighted up. They're normally to warn of bushfires or an accident ahead. You know what those signs said? COVID-19, stay home. We drove on because New South Wales wasn't our home. We were stopped by the police. Police said, you've got Victorian number plates. What are you doing on the road? <clears throat> we said, well, we're going to New Zealand. Here's our passage. We have a permit to go through Victoria. Here's our ta- uh, pl- uh, list of the places we've been and stopped. And they said, okay. So we came to the border. Had to go through two more checkpoints with police. And they allowed us to go through. We had taken our COVID test. We were COVID free when we moved on to Victoria. We learned when we got into Victoria that the COVID tests that we had driven through, no good for international travel, we had to pay for those. And so we got back just in time to get a COVID test and the results of it before we flew out. The next day would have been too late. You all know that there was just a little window of opportunity in there and God favoured us and we are here. And we thank God for that. It had nothing to do with us. We didn't break the law, but we made it. Last week, Hamish told told me a story. I was sitting talking before um, Sabbath school. He told me that uh, they had lived in Fiji. I didn't know that. I I didn't know anything about Hamish. They lived in Fiji. He used to work at the airport. And during all those formative years, Barbara had seen planes and he decided she wanted to be a pilot. That's true, isn't it? She had a passion to be a pilot. And with no money to pay the fees, fees were 45 $42,000 $42,000 for this year. There was no money for that, but they just enrolled and prayed, prayed. I can tell you that today those fees have been paid for this year, that she's boarding somewhere and um, she's halfway through a course and you expect her to finish and the rest of the fees to be paid. It's a marvellous thing to believe in God. I spoke last week to Lee. He's not here this morning. Lee, as you know, is troubled by cancer, has been taking cancer um, treatment of some sort every day for some considerable amount of time. He said, I've got to tell you something. I've decided to stop taking the medication. (sighs) You doing the right thing, Lee? No problem, he said. If God wants to heal me, he can. If he doesn't, I'm happy to wait in the grave. Now, that's the sort of faith, I think, that makes this life free and free to the hilt. I finished with this story I read in the Sabbath school pamphlet. The flight had been uneventful until the moment the captain announced from the flight deck, we've got a bit of a storm ahead, I've switched the seatbelt signed on. It'll be a bit bumpy. Soon after, the plane began to shake violently as it fought its way through the storm. Overhead bins opened. People sat tense in their seats. After a particularly violent shudder of the plane, somebody shrieked. That would have made it easy for everybody, wouldn't it? Images of a wing breaking off and the plane careening to the earth flashed through some minds, I'm sure. I've been through that. Who has been through the same situation? It's not pleasant being up there when the wings are doing this. All the passengers looked tense and fearful. All except for one little girl seated in the front row of the economy. 
She was busy drawing a picture on the open tray table. Now and again, she'd look out the small window when a particularly impressive lightning strike happened, but then she would calmly resume her drawing. After what seemed half an eternity, the plane finally landed and people clapped and shouted, happy to be on the ground. The little girl had packed her bag and was waiting for people to leave the plane when one of the travellers asked her, weren't you afraid during that storm? I saw you colouring in. How could you be that calm during such a major storm? It's the worst I've been through. I wasn't scared, the little girl said to the surprised man. My dad is the pilot. He always gets me home. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, for a faith that grounds our life here. We thank you for salvation through Jesus. But I'm praying that you'll deepen our belief. Help us to know who you are even more. Our provider. You are our safety, here on earth now. We thank you for salvation, but we pray that you'll give us peace, that peace which passes understanding that only comes with a deep belief. In Jesus' name, amen.